When you start on new code, do you guess about whether or not it's going to be useful? Do you guess about what it might have to do in future? Or do you guess about whether it's fast enough, resilient enough or scalable enough? What can we do to reduce the guesswork in software development? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe and we can keep you informed of uh, new videos. And if you'd like to know more, uh, there's, you can sign up for our mail list. The details are below in the description. In this episode, I'm going to talk about how we can write better code by being more experimental. I'm going to describe four attributes of what it takes to be more experimental in writing code and how to put this into practice for real software development. And at the end, I'm going to describe a real war story where we replace the relational database system for an extensive data warehouse in a massive enterprise system using these kinds of techniques. And we managed to achieve all of that change in half a day. The idea of this occasional series, Feynman Bytes, is to try and get, give you some practical tips about how to apply some of the philosophy of science to, uh, to software development. Um, I'm a nerd. I think that science is the best invention that humanity's ever created and at the heart of our high-tech civilization. Richard Feynman was a Nobel Prize winning physicist and a philosopher on the topic of science. So what can we learn from some of the famous statements of Feynman and how could we apply that kind of thinking to our industry? Feynman once said, it doesn't matter how intelligent you are. If you guess and that guess can't be backed up by experimental evidence, then it's still just a guess. So how can we start to move away beyond guesswork and start really getting into the, the realm of ex working it more experimentally? I think four ideas that are important to really being experimental in this kind of practical form are we need to form a hypothesis. We need to, we need to have some kind of prediction, some kind of idea about what, what, you know, what, what it is that we're looking at and, and, and what it is that we're trying to describe. We need to understand the measurement, how we're going to measure uh, our hypothesis and validate it or, or, or falsify it. We need to gather feedback and we need that feedback to be quick and efficient in order, to, in order for it to be relevant to the lessons that we're learning. And if we don't want to get snowed by the, the noise in, in, the, in our experiments, we've got to really control the variables and ideally narrow down each change to one very small change that we can deter so that we can determine its impact when we make that change. In a previous episode, I described those four things and how we could apply those to releasing software into production. In this episode, I want to describe how we can apply those same four things to working with code. How do we use those ideas to make write better code? First, the hypothesis. What sorts of hypotheses are we looking for when we're writing code? I think there are a couple that, that, that seem relevant to, to, to me as a developer and to development teams in general. So I want to know, does this change do what I as a developer expect it to do? Is it, is it really fulfilling the intent that I want? This is kind of the, the, um, double entry bookkeeping version of validation. I've made a change of some kind and I just want to validate that it was the change that I intended it to be. And then there's another kind of validation. Is this change useful in a broader context? Is it going to sort of fill fulfill some need of a user in some sense? Uh, is it going to be delivering some value to somebody uh, in, so, in some realistic sense? Is the code really doing what the users want the code to do? And that's another kind of validation that I think is really important. I think both of these you can kind of bundle together and get a broader picture of what we're talking about in that fundamentally our hypothesis when we're working with continuous delivery anyway is is our code releasable and releasability is going to comprise at least these two things and probably some more as well. Uh, does it fulfill any regulatory requirements? Is it secure? 
Is it scalable? Is it fast enough? All of those things will, will kind of come into defining the releasability of a change. And so we can think about it in those terms, structuring our thinking around our hypothesis. hypothesis is this change releasable and optimizing to allow us to create releasable changes very frequently allows us to learn more quickly. The next in my list of four things is about measurement. And I think when we're talking about code and software development, there are three key ideas that are important in terms of, in terms of measurement. The first is automated testing, and I mean this in the broadest possible sense. All forms of aut automated testing are a form of measurement of our code. They, they're going to measure different attributes of the code. Some tests are going to be telling us that technical quality. Some tests are going to be determining the, 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 the user focus. Uh, the test quant quadrant from, from Brian Marrick that I'm showing here gives us a nice picture of of different styles of tests that we can think of to evaluate different aspects of our code and measure those aspects and understand where we stand in their regard. One particularly strong form of, uh, of measurement in this sense is the use of executable specifications. Again, you can think of those as a form of tests, but we can structure our software development around the use of executable specifications and then measure the, the quality of our changes uh, through, through other forms of testing. This is all good. And the third one in my list is a repeat of what I've already said. Releasability, again, is a key part of measurement. If we can cr create releasable code uh, on a regular, repeated basis, that puts us in a strong position to be able to understand the progress that we are making. Remember, without all of these kinds of measurement, everything that we are doing is still only a guess. And so we must take these things seriously. If you've got any other f favorite Feynman quotes, by the way, please do let me know and, uh, in the comments below, and I'll try and include them in a future episode of Feynman Bytes. Back to my four things. The next on my list is feedback. And feedback takes all kinds of forms. Sure, we want the fast feedback from continuous integration and continuous delivery. We want to use feedback in our design. The quality of our design is, go is, is, is a tool that we can use to gain good feedback. If we're using a refactoring IDE and uh, you know types in, a, in the languages that we program in, that's a form of efficient feedback that can give us great input into, into understanding the, the, the nature of our changes and whether they're being effective. Another great part of feedback, particularly when you're practicing techniques like test-driven development or acceptance test-driven development, is the, the, the testability of our code in the sense of the quality of our code. I argue that testability is a very good metric for uh, the quality in code. If your code is testable, it usually means it, it has a, several of the hallmarks of good quality code as well. And so if, if code is difficult to test, that should be telling us something about the nature of our design and the quality of our design. And we can use that feedback. One of the huge benefits that I perceive in test driven development as a practice, as a discipline, is that it gives me that design feedback very early in the life cycle of the software. I can use writing the tests uh, to, to drive my design and where my, my tests are highlighting difficulties, that's telling me that my design is poor and that I should be looking to improve it. So I can use the smells in, 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 from, from the process, the, 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 the lower quality experience as signals to improve my design. And of course, there's the more obvious forms of feedback too. Dashboards that we can put in our development environments that tell us the state of our continuous integration uh, uh, suites and continuous delivery suites. That's so all of this sorts of feedback is important. And the key attribute, I think, in continuous delivery terms that really matters here is quality of feedback, but also efficiency, speed of feedback. We want feedback to be delivered in a timely manner. So working so that our software is releasable multiple times a day is one key feedback metric that we can kind of drive towards. And getting fast feedback, I usually recommend in under five minutes from our deployment pipelines that the continuous integration stage of our pipeline is, is, is passing is another form of feedback. 
the last section controlling the variables is the biggest I think and probably in many ways they're all important but this is probably one of the more important ones if we genuinely want to be experimental if we genuinely want to start applying some of the ideas of science to practicing software development then controlling the variables is incredibly important and this is an area where I think that all too often we tend to not pay enough attention to it. So the first thing I think to consider when we're trying to control the variables is to make change in small steps. We want to make small changes so that we can determine the impact of each each tiny change and not confuse that impact with lots of other changes that are happening at the same time. The next in this list is test-driven development and executable specifications. Again, these are wonderful tools in terms of controlling the variables. If we have a body of automated tests that are reliable and repeatable, that means that anything that changes, any, any breakages that we see, are highlighted immediately. So we've made our code more deterministic by having these tests around it. It means that any change to it is going to create a failure of some kind and then we can dig into that and find out what, what, went, what went on. The other aspect of this that's probably not quite so obvious is the idea of refactoring. If we want to be able to work in a piece of code, we need to make that code a habitable space. We need to be able to make changes safely without affecting other areas of the code. That's about controlling the variables. And so we want the ability to be able to change an implementation, but maintain its behavior and not have that leak out and spread across the code. This gets into the next of those ideas on my list, uh, separation of concerns. This is a great technique for enabling our ability to refactor. If we design our code so that each piece of code is focused on solving just one problem, one small part of a problem, just one, one, one class, one thing, one method, one thing. If we focus our designs down in that way, one, it makes them eminently testable, but secondly, it means that we can refactor safely behind those interfaces that we present, that, that these pieces of code present to the outside world. This is good design. This is, this, is all, this is all beneficial, but it also makes our code more deterministic and allows us to work in a more disciplined way moving forwards. To do all of this at a broader system level, we've got to have effective configuration management. We need to be able to reliably and repeatably be able to deploy our systems into environments. That means that those environments must be controlled, version controlled. There are some other broader ideas when we think about, about controlling the variables at the level of kind of software design. One of the mistakes that we commonly make as software developers is to think too far ahead and imagine all of the ways in which our software may one day be used and code for that. And that is the road to over-engineering and uh, complex systems. A much more effective approach is to apply kind of what I would think of as defensive design techniques. We want to compartmentalize our code. We want to make our code consist of a series of small modules, each of which is largely self-contained, each of which has a good separation of concerns. That way we are able to um, make change in one place uh, without other, uh, without affecting other areas of the code, but crucially, that way we can then think of enhancing the behaviour in this one particular part of the code, without affecting other other parts of the code. That takes good interface design. It takes good separation of concerns. It takes thinking about and caring about the modularity of our systems. These are key ideas to to make this effective. A good pattern to adopt that's 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 kind of widespread is is the idea of hexagonal architecture hexagonal architecture is essentially we have little bundles of domain logic focused at solving prob problems in the problem domain and then anything that talks to the outside world is kind of an adapter into that domain logic 
So you don't have a piece of logic that, I don't know, has to, knows how to calculate the sales tax on your account and also how to store it in a database. You have a piece of logic that understands how to calculate the sale tax and somewhere else a piece of logic that knows how to store that in a database. This separation of concerns is a very, very strong architectural principle that makes for nice systems, but crucially it controls the variables. It allows us to make change that is open-ended. It allows us to make change that it's where it's possible to substitute alternative implementations in the future without affecting all the rest of the system. These are much better systems. And the reason for this is because this arch these architectural and design approaches allow us to control the variables of future versions of the system that we don't know yet we need. When we start thinking about these ideas in the context of continuous delivery, the deployment pipeline is a crucial and obvious valuable resource. It gives us an experimental platform that allows us to, to work in the ways that we've already explored, to, to form our hypotheses, to, to, to establish some measurements in the form of automated tests and to carry out those measurements, run, running them, them within the bounds of the, of the deployment pipeline and gather the results, fast, efficient feedback. So all of these things are kind of supported through the deployment pipeline. It allows us to control the variables by having a repeatable, reliable, efficient process that goes from commit to releasable outcome. And if we can do that repeatably and reliably, then again, we've, we've kind of limited the amount of variation that's, that's ever likely to occur. And so have much clearer picture about what's going on when, change, when we flow change through the pipeline. To conclude, I'm going to talk about how we, how we can put this into practice with a real world example. A few years ago, I worked on uh, building one of the world's highest performance financial exchanges. Uh, and at some point we decided that we didn't like the commercial terms that we had with our relational database vendor. Our hypothesis was that if we replaced the commercial relational database for, one of, for our data warehouse with uh, an off-the-shelf um, open source version, that would be as good. That was, that was, that was the theory that we were going to test. We thought that we would measure this through our automated test suites. We already had an extensive range of automated testing that evaluated the, the behavior and performance of our system from lightweight unit tests to whole system performance and acceptance tests. So we measured the, the, our change through, through this. What we did was that we decided that we were going to do this. We downloaded the package for the open source version of the RDBMS. Um, we scripted it using the patterns that we'd already established for scripts. We weren't going to change all of those things. We were controlling the variables. We were using largely the same scripting mechanism that we always used. Um, once we had that script in place, we committed that to our, to our version control system, which initiated our deployment pipeline. The deployment pipeline whirred away and evaluated, ran all of the tests, and two tests failed. Uh, so we, we, we reverted the change, we had a look into what went wrong, uh, our, our experiment had failed, our hypothesis had been proven to be false uh, up to this point. We went and looked again and see, went to see if we could revise our experiment. We changed, we changed the parameters a little bit, we, we, we did some tinkering with the code, we committed the new change. That triggered the deployment pipeline again, which went away and ran and evaluated all of those changes and it said that they passed. The next time we released into production, we released with that version, uh, with the, the new open source version of the relational database system. So we controlled the variables by using the, the exactly the same pipeline as before, exactly the same tests as before, exactly the same deployment scripts with a few minor tweaks as before. We got great feedback because our pipeline was able to run all of these things very quickly. Um, we, the separation of concerns uh, in our system meant that architecturally it was okay for us to, to pull out the, the old version of the relational database and plug in this new version. Again, controlling the variables. The rest of the system was unchanged and unaware of any changes because of the separation of concerns in our architecture.
So applying these principles meant that we were able to unplug and plug in a new version of our relational database system. The whole story that I just told you took about half a day. I've worked places where that, that story would either be impossible or would have tamed, took a team of six people for eight months or something like that. All of what I told you from the, from the idea to implementing this and getting a passing release candidate took us a morning because we got speed and efficiency and we'd controlled all of the variables. The only variable was the relational database management system itself. Everything else was the same. This is that these techniques are remarkably powerful and have a profound impact on our ability to create higher quality systems. Thank you very much indeed for watching.